I believe that God has called every believer to preach the word. Now, whether or not you proclaim the word in a public forum is not the issue. The truth is that God wants to anoint your preaching. Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and you're watching Spirit Church on Encounter TV. On this edition of Spirit Church, I'm giving you five keys to anointed preaching as we continue our series on the anointing. Stephen Moctezuma is here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in worship, and then we're going to get into this lesson. And I believe as you hear this word, that it's going to transform the way you declare the word of God. Here's Stephen Moctezuma. The scripture says in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. The preaching of the truth, the declaration of the word of God, sets the captives free. When you declare the gospel of Jesus Christ or any of the truths found in his word, you are speaking into existence the liberation of those around you. The preaching of the gospel, backed by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, is the most powerful force in the world that can transform hearts, minds, and because of that, the entire world. I believe that God has anointed you to preach. Now, you may say, but I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. And though you may not have one of the offices of the fivefold gifts that you see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, I believe, 
you still are called to preach the gospel. But this message is for both those who are called to the public declaration of the word in ministry from pulpits and from various media platforms, and for those of you who just want to see the anointing of the Holy Spirit back your declaration of His word in your everyday life. You may feel sometimes that when you preach His word that it's missing something to it, and that is the anointing. We must rely on the anointing of the Holy Spirit to back the preaching of the Word. And when we proclaim this gospel, we are taking part in God's agenda for the ages. We are participating in a global evangelism effort. We are participating in kingdom expansion. The anointing of the Holy Spirit will literally back your words. As you speak and as you declare, I believe there is tangible power that is carried on the sound waves that come from your voice. And so we need to be people who declare the word with the anointing of the Holy Spirit if we're going to see those around us liberated. And I want to read another verse to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says, Since God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom, He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. God uses preaching. God uses declaration. We just read in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, about the declaration of the word, the declaration of the truth. And if we look at those verses again, let's just go through it very slowly. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Remember, that's the anointing. The Spirit's work within you and through you. For He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The purpose of the anointing on your life is the declaration of the good news or the gospel. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. What's amazing to me is that this simple proclamation that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, is what liberates them. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The truth is the liberator of the souls of men. Now, how do we receive the anointing? How do we live in such a way that we make ourselves available to the anointing of the Holy Spirit? How do we act in a way that will cause us to be backed by the anointing of the Holy Spirit when we preach? Well, I'm going to give you five keys to anointed preaching. And these are very practical, but I believe that practicality and simplicity bring about true depths of the Spirit. So, number one, the first key to anointed preaching is passion for the Word. We need to have a hunger, a appreciation, an adoration for, and almost an obsession with the Word of God. This is what transformed my life. When I was first getting into the ministry, I recognized that there was this hunger stirring in me for the Word. And the way you develop and cultivate the hunger for the Word is through the reading of the Word. And so it does take discipline to initiate the receiving of the Word in your life, but once this happens, your appetite for the Word begins to grow. Your appreciation for the Word begins to grow. I want to go to John chapter 6, and I'm going to read you just a few verses from John chapter 6. Now this is powerful teaching here from Jesus, and He says in John chapter 6, verses 61 through 68, that, well, those verses are not all Jesus speaking, but it's the context. So go to verse 61. Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second, and we're going to continue reading that context in just a moment. But here, Jesus is presenting a teaching to his disciples and a crowd of onlookers that is very hard for them to receive. And in fact, some of them were almost offended by the words that he was declaring. And instead of backing down and rephrasing, what Jesus does is say, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? So he takes it up a level of intensity. Instead of backing down, he continues to proclaim the truth. 
And he begins to describe the words that he's speaking as spirit and life. The scripture says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. When you preach the word of God, you're speaking life. And we need to develop a passion for this word so that the life can flow through us, so that resurrection life can affect those around us. The scripture goes on to say, then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. Verse 66, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, are you also going to leave? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. To whom would we go? He has a passion for the words that proceed out of the Savior's mouth. He says, Lord, I wouldn't go anywhere else because I'm drawn to the word in you. When you develop a passion for the word, it's contagious. You speak and people can hear the truth flowing from you. And that really is the anointing. The anointing and the word of God and revelation of the word and declaration of the word and appreciation for the word, all of these things are very close knit. And when you begin to fill yourself with the word because of the passion, it begins to flow out of you. And as the word flows out of you, the anointing flows out of you. Why? Because we know who the word is. Jesus is the word. So a passion for the word is really a passion for Jesus. And the passion for Jesus is a passion for the word. You see this manifested in your desires and something happens in you. You're pulled, you're drawn to the word of God. When you hear it, it brings life. When you declare it, it gives life. And this passion, as I just said, is contagious. I believe that one of the blessings of being able to teach through media like this is that as I teach, people get hungry for the Word. They say within themselves, Lord, I want to study the Word. I want to get into the Word. And it does something in them. Even now as I'm talking, it's possible that there's a hunger for the Word stirring in you, a passion. And that comes from having a passion for the Word yourself. And many of you have that passion. And that passion that you have, people can see it, people can read it. And when you talk, there's weight behind your words. When you speak, there's a power that backs you. There's a heaviness of the glory as you declare things. You know, I sit down with people all the time and have conversations with them. And most of the time when people sit down with me, they just want to get into the Word. They want to talk about the things of God. And I go right along with it. I love talking about the Word and the things of God. And as we're talking, sometimes right there at dinner or right there just fellowshipping wherever we may be, the presence of Jesus becomes real just as we declare the word, just as we talk about him, just as we discuss our passion. And the Lord is drawn, his manifested presence is drawn upon those who have this passion, this desire, this obsession with the word. And that is the first key to anointed preaching is a passion for the word. Number two, after number one, a passion for the word. Number two, a devotion to the word. This part takes discipline. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 15 and 16 from the King James Version we read where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So this scripture here, Timothy is being instructed to avoid debates and avoid certain areas of fleshly exploration of the word. So in one sense, this is a call to the word. This is a challenge to discipline oneself, to study the scripture. And in another sense, it's also a warning to avoid purely intellectual observation of the word. Information is good. Inspiration is better. Information puffs you up. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. This is not saying that we shouldn't read the Word, but we shouldn't read the Word with a fleshly approach. It's a spiritual book. These are words of life. This, this is 
of the Spirit. This is by the Spirit. You can only understand the word truly by revelation of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you can't grasp the concepts in your mind. I'm simply saying that you cannot fully appreciate spiritually and receive all the benefits from the word unless you do it by the Spirit. But this takes discipline. You have to have devotion. There has to be some practical preparation for the word. Now, I've watched preachers who don't prepare the word. I remember I was sitting in one service and I was on this panel where we were answering questions and each of the speakers took a turn preaching to the people. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm just being honest with you. One of the preachers, he um, was not prepared and it showed. And this preacher, he explained to me his philosophy, which was, oh, you don't really need to study the word too much. Oh, you don't really want to get too into the word. You want to just preach a quick five minute lesson and then go on on whatever you do. But the truth is that there is no power without devotion to the Word. There is no anointing without the discipline to the Word. There are some times I'll watch people and they'll begin to preach the Word of God and instead of having one thought that they focus in on, they preach all of these little things and hope that they just stick. Now that's wonderful, that's helpful, but the truth is that we need preaching of the Word of God that is laser focused on concepts and truths that help us to understand those truths in a deeper way. We cannot just have a superficial understanding, have superficiality to our preaching, quick encouragements, quick anecdotes, quick rhyming phrases that encourage people, yes, and maybe even excite people. We need to get into the depths of the Word. I am praying that there would be a renaissance, a revival of deep, spirit-filled preaching. I'm not talking about weird preaching. I'm talking about spiritual preaching. I think this should go beyond self-help. I think this should go beyond just superficial encouragement when God has called us to supernatural enlightenment. And we need to find that place again where the Word of God is a discipline in our lives, where we're not just taking four or five verses and preaching an encouraging word on them. That's helpful and that has its place. And if your gift is to encourage, encourage. But I'm saying if you're going to preach, if you want ministry, if you want to declare the word, I'm telling you, if you want to really see the anointing on your preaching, you need to be disciplined and you need to devote yourself to the word. It cannot be that you preach all you know about the word in 10 minutes during a sermon. If you can preach an entire context of scripture in 10 minutes, it means you don't understand that context well enough. It means you don't understand that book well enough. I believe that preachers should preach out of the overflow. And when a preacher or a minister or a believer declares truth backed by a depth, a well of understanding, then there is a sense about their words. You can sense the depth to their words when they declare things that are backed and rooted more deeply than what is exposed. So when someone declares the word superficially, you can tell. And I've had people, their philosophy as well, the less the, the Holy Spirit can really move if I just preach a five minute sermon, put the Bible down and then begin doing what I do. But what is the point of the miracles? What is the point of the prophetic words? What is the point of the sense of God's presence and the manifestations of power, if not to back the word? I wanna tell you, the less of the Word of God you have in your life, it doesn't mean that you have a better flow of the Spirit. In fact, those who are truly spiritual have more and more and more of the Word of God in their life. I'm not saying you have to preach three hours every time you minister. I'm simply saying we have to be devoted to the Word. We have to prepare the man. I was talking to Dr. Ralph Wilkerson, who's the pastor of Malady Land. He's been a wonderful mentor in my life, and I so appreciate Dr. Ralph Wilkerson. He did, he, uh, he helped uh, bring Miss Catherine Coleman out to California. Uh, he was connected with Oral Roberts and many other great healing ministries. And I'm so appreciative of the impartation he's given me. But he's told me several times before. He says, David, when you go to preach, don't prepare a sermon. Prepare the man. He was telling me, in other words, you can study and you can get into the Word for yourself and prepare yourself as a spiritual 
source, a spiritual well from which others can draw, and then the sermon itself will develop from there. I'm always ready to preach. Why? Because I get into the Word every day, because I'm receiving revelation all the time, because it's a discipline in my life. You wonder how, how on earth I can preach every single week and every single week come up with different topics from different angles that you've probably never heard? It's because of discipline to the Word. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this so that you would be provoked to holy jealousy and say, I want that. And if you want it, you can have it. It's for every believer, but you have to devote to the Word. You have to get into the Word. You have to preach from the source of the depth of the study of God's Word. Show yourself approved unto God. So number one, passion for the Word. Number two, devotion to the Word. Number three, meditation on the Word. Now this has to do with your thinking. If devotion to the Word is you getting into the Word of God, then meditation on the Word is God's Word getting into you. You have to be intentional about both devotion to the Word and meditation upon the Word. I want to go to Psalm chapter 119 and the scripture says this, I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I praise you, O Lord, teach me your decrees. I have recited aloud all the regulations you have given us. I have rejoiced in your laws as much as in riches. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. This is meditation on the word. So passion for the word, which is an obsession with what God is doing in his word, with what God is speaking now through his word. A devotion to the word, which is the discipline, which will help to anoint your preaching. And number three, meditation on the word. This is when you've received the word through devotion to the Word, you now meditate on it. You think on it. You recite it. You ponder it. You slowly go through it. When I get into the Word of God and I study the Word, people often don't understand that I don't have these certain goals that I set for myself as most people do as far as markers go in the, in the Word. Most people think that I would read dozens and dozens of chapters of the Bible every week, I probably go through every week maybe two or three chapters of the Word. And the reason is I read it slowly. I dissect it. I learn about the book of the Bible. Then I learn about the chapter. And then I learn about the verse. And then I learn about the individual words. And I ponder the Word of God. I reflect upon the Word of God. I get a concept in my mind, and it's in my mind all day, which is why I can pull experiences from my life because I'm constantly thinking about it. I find all of these connections. I challenge you. Try this. Capture a concept. Capture a truth from the Word. Hold it in your mind. Read and reread the same couple chapters every day for a week. Do it again and again. Find the context. Find the historical setting. Find the meaning of the original language and just think about those concepts again and again and again. And as you move through your everyday life, you're going to find things in everyday life that you've never seen before. And you'll be reminded of certain things that you've forgotten. And while you're hearing a preacher preach, they'll say something maybe from another context of Scripture or from another book of the Bible, and you'll be able to pull and say, this connects with this here. This backs what this is saying here. And you begin to cross-reference the Scripture all because you're meditating on the Word. And as you meditate on the Word, it changes your thinking. And as a man thinks, so is he. This is the third key to anointed preaching. The fourth key to anointed preaching, again, number one, passion for the Word. Number two, devotion to the Word. Number three, meditation on the Word. Number four, revelation from the Word. John chapter 14, verse 26 says, but the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. The Holy Spirit 
reminds us of what is in the written word while teaching us from the word. In other words, the Holy Spirit gives us revelation not about the word per se, but from the word. Now, I know there are critics who will say, well, God doesn't speak anymore. The word of God is all 66 books of this Bible, no less and no more. Well, first of all, I find it very presumptuous to believe that an eternal God could be fully comprehended in a finite amount of pages. This is not enough to describe the entirety of who God is. And some would say, well, God's done speaking. He doesn't speak by the Spirit per se to our hearts, but He by the Spirit speaks through these words. And that's true, but that doesn't mean He can't speak to our spirits also. That doesn't mean we cannot hear now the voice of God. And I find it interesting that these same people who say God has finished speaking commit themselves to a very bizarre form of hypocrisy. This is what I mean. I've had conversations with them several times. Let's say, well, you, you can't say that. You can't prophesy. You can't receive revelation because this is the final authority. It's no more, no less. And I'll ask them, so let me ask, why, why is it you believe that these 66 books of the Bible are all that God has said? Show me in the Bible where it gives us a list of these 66 books. And they'll say, well, it's, you know, Timothy, the scripture says that the word of God, the, 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 the scripture is God breathed. And it comes from him. It comes from the spirit. And I say, okay, that does tell us that the word of God is from him and spirit breathed, but it doesn't tell us what the word of God is. I believe this is the word of God. The problem for them is it's an extra biblical idea to say that this is the word of God. They believe that this is the word of God, these 66 books, by revelation from the Holy Spirit. So to say that the Holy Spirit cannot speak outside of the word is to tear away at the very foundation of why they believe this is the word in the first place. There are many other books that didn't make it in, and they believe that was by the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing in the scripture that says that after revelation, it was finished. They say, well, the book of Revelation says not to add to this prophecy. This prophecy, not... 66 books. Remember, Revelation wasn't written as the last book of this Bible. It was written as the prophetic declaration of John as he saw a revelation of Jesus. And it's saying, don't add to that prophecy. But it's not saying that God cannot speak outside of these 66 books. It's nonsense. Anyone who believes that has to acknowledge that that is an extra biblical idea. In other words, they're believing their whole basis of their belief is actually founded upon what they criticize us for. So, of course, God still speaks. Now, he reminds and he reveals. He reminds us of the word. Now, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. He comes alongside of us and helps us to understand this word. I remember there was a time in my life when I'd read the scripture and I just couldn't get it. I, things just weren't clicking for me. Concepts weren't arising. And I read in James chapter 1 where it says that if you lack wisdom, you can ask God and he'll give it to you. And so with childlike faith, I said, Lord, I want your wisdom. And he gave me the wisdom to understand his word. And he can do it for you too. But it's important to know that devotion to God's word is the foundation of the revelation of God's word. Devotion is the foundation of revelation. The Holy Spirit speaks from this and through this. And this is our foundation for understanding his voice. He will not speak anything that contradicts this. And he will not speak anything that causes us to perform an act that this book tells us to not do or vice versa. And so we must find the revelation from the word by the Holy Spirit. You cannot approach this book without revelation. It's not information. It's inspiration and revelation. And so devotion to God's word again, is that foundation. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. The anointing fills in for our gaps and our lacks. 
The anointing helps us to understand this. The anointing helps us to preach with more power. And that anointing is found by revelation. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8, we see that Peter and John are confronted by religious leaders and they, by the Holy Spirit, speak. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13 says, When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. So that is key number four, revelation from the Word. So number one, passion for the Word. Number two, devotion to the Word. Number three, meditation on the Word. Number four, revelation from the Word. And finally, number five, declaration of the Word. We must be faithful to declare His Word. This is what it says in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And the disciples went everywhere and preached. And the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Acts chapter 14, verse 3 says, But the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them power to do miraculous signs and wonders. Our central declaration must be Christ. And when we preach the word, and Christ is the word, there is power on our preaching. What good does it do to have the potential of power if we never unleash it? What good is it to be anointed if we never declare the word? So the fifth and final key to anointed preaching is to actually open your mouth, is to actually declare, is to step out in boldness and proclaim the truth despite who it may offend and despite who may not like it. We need to preach the word. We need to declare the gospel message. Now, I find that preaching the gospel is the only thing that brings about the demonstration of God's power. In fact, I've been in services where I'll just do teachings just like this, and I'll go and do that for a church sometimes. Sometimes it's just the body of believers. And the miracles are great. The presence of God is awesome. But there is a more powerful manifestation when I preach the gospel. When I preach the gospel of salvation, creative miracles happen. God will always confirm His Word with signs. God will always back His message with confirmation. God will authenticate the anointing on you when you declare His truth. If you're not seeing miracles, it's time to start preaching the truth. If you're not seeing power, it's time to start declaring the Word of God. So you have seen through this teaching that the key to the anointing, superficially speaking, without getting into each one of these keys, is the Word of God. The Word of God in you, upon you, through you, it is the Word of God. Saturate yourself with the Word and you will see a more anointed presentation of the preaching of the truth through your life. So again, just to recap, number one, passion for His Word. This is obsession and adoration of His Word. Number two, devotion to His Word. This is the discipline and the practical steps. Yes, you should flow in the spiritual gifts. Yes, you should pray for the sick and such, but it's more important to first declare the word, and it does not make you spiritual to neglect the preaching of the word in your ministry. Number three, meditation on his word. This is running through it in your mind constantly, letting it get inside of you, understanding the concepts, dissecting everything, and pulling from life experiences and other people's declaration of the word to help you understand the truth in a greater depth. Number four, revelation from His Word. By the Holy Spirit, we must receive revelation, not necessarily about His Word, but from His Word. In other words, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, He will speak to us from the foundation of the Word. And finally, number five, declaration of His Word. It does us no good to be anointed unless we open our mouth and declare His truth. I want to pray with you now. Let us believe that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will back your message. I pray, Lord, that that one watching would declare the gospel with such grace and anointing that men and women would have their hearts turned toward you. Jesus, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would anoint that one watching. Stir in that one watching, Lord, a hunger for your word. 
Give us the strength and the discipline to become devoted to your word. Holy Spirit, be our helper and our teacher and remind us to meditate on the word. And Jesus, we pray that as we obey your word and declare your word, that you would entrust us with a revelation from your word. Father, give us boldness to declare it. Give us the grace to flow in it. There's somebody watching me right now. You used to preach the word with such passion. You used to be in the Bible every day. When there was a preaching of the gospel, when there was a teaching of the word, you couldn't be kept from it. Something happened, distraction and life. That's okay. The Lord is stirring in you a hunger today. And He is going to anoint you. That's right. He's going to forgive you and He's going to anoint you. So step out in faith. There's someone else watching me right now. You struggle with severe migraine headaches. God's healing you. I feel the healing anointing. I, I, sometimes it just comes. It's flowing now. Stretch your hands toward mine. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your healing anointing would flow. I rebuke diabetes in Jesus' name. I rebuke cancer in Jesus' name. Someone's being healed. It's, it's interesting. You're, you're, you're kind of interested that you're even watching this on YouTube. But you're being healed of arthritis right now. God drew you to this video. The power of God is coming. You feel a heat coming on you. He is making you completely whole. Come on, stretch your hands for mine. Believe in faith. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We give you praise, Father, for all that you do. Jesus, only you can do this. Someone's right ear just been healed. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. We give you the glory, Jesus. There's an issue with hair loss, a woman watching. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Yes, he cares about those issues too. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father. There's someone else watching me. Um, you have a disease you're believing for God healing, God's healing power to touch you. And the medication makes you sick. And you're crying out to God, and it's been a few years, and you're crying out to God saying, when? I pray right now, be your moment in Jesus' name. I declare by faith. Come on, let's agree. Let's ask the Lord right now. Someone, someone's, being, someone's being encouraged right now. Let me tell you something. This is your moment. Something good is going to happen to you right now. Something good is going to happen to you right now. In Jesus' name. Just have faith. Only believe. He's able and he's willing. Only believe. Severe depression is being broken right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. Anxiety is being broken right now in Jesus' name. I can feel this anointing. You, I, I know you can feel it too. It's just flowing right now. Lord, I give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. And I want you to agree with me. Say, amen. I know that some of you are waiting for me to call something out, but you don't have to wait. The anointing is flowing. In fact, it flows all the way through from start to finish on this program because we pray that God anoints it. I don't even know how to transition to that, but I have to. I want to welcome now the new members of Spirit Church. Up on the screen, you're going to see your name if you join Spirit Church. And we welcome you. As I always say, we love you and we are praying for you. And we, the Spirit Church family, are one gracious, happy family. If you'd like information on how you can join Spirit Church, click on the link that's just about to appear over my head or use the information at the bottom of the screen to find out how you can become a member. If you're not watching this on YouTube, those links don't appear over your head. Instead, again, use the information at the bottom of the screen to manually find how you can become a member. I have another update for you and I want you to hear it. Don't turn off the video. Don't, don't say I'm done. I'm talking to you. Don't, don't click out of this. Stay right here with me. I'm going to read your comments, and then we're going to go, and I want to talk to you about something, okay? Uh, this comment is from Glory to Glory. Thank you, David, for this video. You talked directly to me 
I started an orphanage last year, but I just decided to stop it a couple of months ago because I thought it was not God's will for me. Thanks very much, Pastor David, for this awakening. When I was praying for someone, I was talking about a focused anointing. These comments are from that video, A Focused Anointing. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you go check it out. I talk about how you can become so focused that the power of God flows. You are most anointed when you find that specific place that God wants you to be, and I give you keys on how to find that. And that's what this person is talking about, and they were encouraged in that way. Piano Deanna writes, Beautiful teaching, Brother David. The ten answers were so simple in finding the will of God. I feel the Holy Spirit moving. God bless. Well, thank you for watching in Spirit Church on Encounter TV. We appreciate all your viewership. Ann Graves writes, Thank you so much, David, once again for a truly wonderful message of encouragement and the love of God. May He bless your ministry a hundredfold. I love listening to the truth of God. Love and blessings to you and your loved ones. Well, Ann, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Love and blessings to you and your loved ones as well. Precious T writes, The Spirit of the Lord led me to this message, and you just confirmed the anointing upon my life to work with children. Thank you very much, Pastor David. God bless you. Lord, have your way in me. Well, often the Word of God can apply to more than one person, and I didn't necessarily give a word of knowledge for that. I just mentioned that some of you, maybe you, you're supposed to work with children, and people connected with that spiritually, and they received the confirmation. There were other things I listed in that video, and other things that people felt confirmed, so I recommend you check it out. Yeshua's daughter writes, Pastor David, I've been watching your videos for a while now, and all of them have ministered to me. However, this one, wow, what can I say? As you were teaching, I became so uncomfortable, and I began to cry a little because everything you said resonated with my spirit. Funny enough, I had just sowed a seed for a prophetic word I had received that I'm called to ministry, but I wasn't quite sure in what capacity. Now I know, just start. And if I'm wrong, God will redirect me. That's right. You cannot be so afraid of inaccuracy that you settle for inaction. God will punish inaction before he will punish inaccuracy. He sees your heart. He sees you're trying to do his work. And as you take steps to do his work, as you take steps to preach the gospel and spread his kingdom everywhere, he will guide you if you get off track. He's not going to be angry with you if you miss a, a location or a ministry style or anything like that. Stay connected to the Lord, seek His direction, don't be presumptuous, but also avoid that other extreme of inaction. Diane Black writes, Thanks, you are really a mouthpiece for God. This was a timely message and is something I am seeking the Lord about, and this is a confirmation for me to move. I am the last servant who didn't want to do anything outside of God's will. Well, we can often identify with things in Scripture, and I'm glad that the Lord revealed that to you. Diane. Charlotte King writes, I thank God for the anointing that is on your life to teach his word. I work a third shift job sitting at a desk. Every night as I watch your messages, the Holy Spirit meets me there and speaks to me through your anointing. I am so grateful to God that he purposed me to stumble across your ministry. I've been watching every night that I work since. Thank you for blessing me, man of God. Well, Charlotte King, thank you for watching. I know there is a purpose and anointing on your life as well. And I truly believe that you can also declare the word with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's it for the comments. If you want me to read your comment, go ahead and leave a comment here. If you're watching this on YouTube, right below. And keep it concise, keep it short, and I'll read it. Questions, comments, even if there's something with which you disagree that I said, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Okay, I want to talk to you now. The announcement that we made, now last week, I, there was a little bit of confusion last week that I had announced this because I got excited and I wanted to share this with you. I had talked about how we reached our goal for the month of October. What I meant by that was this. Our ministry needs to bring in an extra $30,000 every single month in order to expand to the next phase of ministry. It's not just a building. It's a building. It's new equipment. It's, it's new workers for the ministry. It's uh, because it's going to be a production facility. It's going to be 24-7 prayer, prayer center. It's going to be how we expand to reach um, more people. It's going to also give us the ability to go live from the studio. So we'll start a live broadcast in addition to Spirit Church, in, a different, in addition to Encounter TV. We're also going to do what's called impartation live from the set. Um, 
that monthly cost would also go to doing more events nationally and internationally and on larger scales. We're getting bigger crowds. I'm telling you, the crowds are going. I literally just got back today filming this from North Carolina. Every single day in North Carolina, we had overflow crowds. Five services, all of them overflow crowds, and every crowd was a different group of people. And so that tells me that people are hungry for the power of God. So we need to get bigger venues and we want to go to more places. I got requests from Africa. I got requests from um, India. I got requests from Israel. I got requests from all over the Middle East, Florida, New York, Texas, Maine. I mean, you name it. I, mean, I can just, almost every part of the world we've received, Australia, New Zealand, I, on and on and on and on. And so we want to respond. We want to say yes to these, but we can only do what we're able to do as far as our resources allow. So we don't take out loans to, to throw these events. I don't believe that's good stewardship. Instead, we save and we put on these events. These events cost tens of thousands of dollars. It's the venue, it's the flights for the team, it's, it's the production equipment, it's the camera equipment, it's the marketing so that people know that it's available. And people come to these events, they get saved. So that $30,000 a month is not just for the building, the extra 30,000, it's for workers, it's for more events, it's to take care of that building. It's to take care of the extra production. It's to keep the facility open 24-7, all of that. Now, in October, we reached that extra 30000 or so. It wasn't exactly that number, but just about that. We reached that in October from just the people giving above what normally comes into the ministry. There's a base cost. Now, we need to be able to do that extra $30,000 every single month. So I was saying... If, in other words, if everybody who gave in October did what they did monthly, if everybody did that, we'd have it. So as far as the 1,000 new $30 a month partners, we need those new partners to come in so that we can do this on a month. It has to be sustainable because we need to use wisdom and we need to do it according to stewardship principles. So I need 1,000 new $30 a month partners. Out of those that we need, I think we had, and don't quote me on this, but just from what I'm able to judge from numbers, we had anywhere from one to 200 people sign up to become new partners. And we're so grateful for that. So what we're doing is we're saving money aside for the one-time costs for that building. And so those of you who are keep sewing monthly, keep sewing monthly because it's not, it's not going nowhere. It's going into the ministry. We're using it for all the things that we do. We do need new partners. I want to do this. Let me tell you something. You know our why. It's souls, 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 souls. Help us expand this ministry. I see a day, church, listen to me, we're going to fill stadiums together and we're going to see thousands come to Jesus and we are going to change the world. So become a partner today. All you have to do to make this happen is sign up to become a partner for $30 a month. Sign up for the automatic monthly giving plan. Some of you do 100 a month, some of you do 10 a month. Just do what you can today right now and help us reach that monthly goal so that we can step out into this next phase of ministry and we're going to expand this and it is going to explode. I'm telling you, it's gonna be big time and we're gonna do it big time for Jesus and we're gonna do it first class for Jesus. We're gonna do this right. We are going to expand the kingdom. I believe it because I serve a big God. As Catherine Coleman used to say, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. Well, that is it for this edition of Spirit Church here on Encounter TV. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God. Hey fam, Stephen Moctezuma here. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel and to share our content. I hope you're enjoying all the content that we're sending your way. In addition to David's teachings and ministry videos, you can also join me on my worship playlist where I release a brand new video every week. Thank you guys so much for watching Encounter TV. God bless.